everyone. Hi. Welcome back to Welcome back to our Legal Aid Chit Chat. My name is Sue and I'll be your moderator for today. Our speakers for today are Joshua, Sinu, Mike, and Edmund. We will be touching on a few issues, which includes uh, Riza Aziz's case, uh, queries on employment, right to health, and how to save Malaysia's economy. So first up, we will have Joshua that will explain the law on discharge to us. Uh, Joshua, you can take the floor. Okay. Um, hi, semua. Jadi, um, dua, tiga hari lepas, uh, berita hangat lah ialah kes Riza Aziz ya, di mana uh, dilaporkan dalam media uh, media masa bahawa ada uh, social media uh, bahawa beliau kes beliau telah uh, digugurkan dan beliau telah dilepaskan. Ya, jadi uh, kalau kita lihat uh, kenyataan kenyataan media dan artikel-artikel uh, atau berita atau laporan berita dapati bahawa uh, kenyataan media tersebut merujuk kepada uh, surat representasi eh, representasi yang telah dikemukakan oleh pihak pembelaan atau peguam-peguam bela bagi uh, Riza Aziz jadi pertama sekali saya nak cakap lah uh, atau nak jelaskan apa ni representasi ni apa maksudnya representasi jadi bagi bagi uh, peguam-peguam bela yang yang uh, ada membawa atau mengendalikan kes jenayah uh, representasi ini bukan satu yang asing lah ini satu amalan biasa yang uh, yang kita uh, buat dalam uh, mengendalikan sesuatu kes jenayah jadi secara asasnya surat representasi ini ialah satu surat dia satu surat rayuan eh, atau permohonan di mana pihak pembelaan akan meminta atau memohon kepada pihak pendakwaan um, untuk secara lazimnya untuk menggugurkan pendakwaan atau um, untuk me, untuk mengkaji semula pertuduhan terhadap seseorang tertuduh dan kemudian membuat keputusan sama ada tu menggugurkan uh, pendakwaan atau um, mengemukakan uh, pertuduhan baru bagi kesalahan yang lebih ringan ya jadi contohnya macam kesalahan uh, pengedaran dada kami biasanya akan menghantar representasi untuk memohon supaya sama ada pertuduhan tersebut digugurkan atau dikurangkan kepada pemilik kan dada ya jadi satu kesalahan yang uh, kurang uh, kurang serius daripada pertuduhan asal jadi dalam surat representasi tersebut peguam bela akan memajukan alasan-alasan kepada pihak pendakwaan mengapa ya, untuk menyokong permohonan kami jadi secara lazimnya kami akan memasukkan alasan seperti um, versi pihak pembelaan yang uh, mungkin belum dipertimbangkan atau belum dimaklumkan kepada pihak pendakwaan jadi pihak pendakwaan boleh melihat secara holistik atau secara lebih komplit uh, menyeluruh uh, sesuatu kes tersebut dan uh, kadang-kadang terdapat juga uh, situasi di mana pihak pembelaan akan highlight akan um, fokus kepada kelompangan atau kelemahan kes pendakwaan jadi kami akan memberi pendapat atau pandangan kami atau menyatakan pandangan kami berkenaan dan memberi alasan kenapa pada pendapat kami uh, kes pihak pendakwaan tidak cukup untuk um, mensabitkan sesu- seseorang tertuduh dengan sesuatu kesalahan ya yeah. jadi um, surat representasi ini dia menjurus kepada um, kuasa kuasa pendakwa raya untuk memulakan, mengendalikan dan menghentikan sesuatu pendakwaan dan apabila pihak pendakwaan atau pihak uh, pendakwa raya mem- menarik balik atau menggugurkan atau tidak ingin 
meneruskan dengan sesuatu uh, pendakwaan maka pihak mahkamah akan mempunyai dua pilihan sama ada untuk uh, melepaskan tanpa membebaskan seseorang tertuduh atau melepaskan dan membebaskan jadi melep- perintah pelepasan tanpa pembebasan atau lebih dikenali sebagai uh, DNAA uh, discharge not amounting to acquittal bermaksud seseorang itu akan dilepaskan daripada pertuduhan beliau tetapi tak akan dibebaskan jadi uh, ia bermaksud bahawa uh, individu tersebut boleh didakwa semula di mahkamah ya? jadi dalam kes Riza Aziz ni beliau dilepaskan tanpa dibebaskan jadi uh, dan kalau kita baca kenyataan media terdapat syarat-syarat ya, bagi Um, di dalam representasi beliau yang telah dipersetujui oleh kedua-dua pihak dan mengikut kenyataan media tersebut sekiranya syarat-syarat tersebut tidak dipenuhi maka beliau akan uh, dituduh semula di mahkamah ya dan dan option pilihan satu lagi seperti yang saya nyatakan tadi uh, dilepaskan dan dibebaskan ya. dia tak kena mengena dengan kes visa Aziz ni tapi cuma untuk penjelasan uh, sekiranya mahkamah mengarahkan perintah pelepasan dan pembebasan maka seseorang itu tidak boleh uh, didakwa semula di mahkamah eh, jadi itu secara uh, big picture secara keseluruhan lah, atau secara amnya um, isu berkenaan surat representasi uh, kuasa pendakwa raya untuk untuk men- memulakan menerus, mengendalikan dan uh, menarik balik pendakwaan dan juga perintah lah, perintah pembebasan dan pelepasan yang um, diperintahkan oleh mahkamah. Ya, yeah? uh, so, so saya rasa itu saja uh, secara amnya uh, prinsip undang-undang yang uh, terlibat dalam kes Riza Aziz. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Josh, terima kasih atas penerangan tentang serepresentasi dan apa maksud pembebasan dan pelepasan. Ni nak tanya, apa pandangan Josh tentang kes Riza? Jadi, uh, per, pa, pada pendapat saya, terdapat beberapa isu lah dalam uh, kes ini. Yang pertama sekali ialah um, kalau kita baca kenyataan media oleh uh, Jabatan Peguam Negara, jumlah wang ya yang terlibat adalah lebih kurang dinyatakan adalah lebih kurang 250 250 juta US dollar ya melibatkan sejumlah wang tersebut tetapi kemudian kalau kita lihat di di penghujung kenyataan media tersebut pihak jabatan peguam negara menyatakan bahawa kerajaan Malaysia dijangka akan menerima kembali sejumlah 108 juta di atas atau secara tambahan kepada USD 57 juta. Jadi saya rasa terdapat um, satu gap, satu kelompangan di antara kedua-dua jumlah tersebut kerana di dalam pendakwaan dinyatakan bahawa uh, tertuduh telah terlibat dalam pengubahan wang haram berjumlah 200, sekitar 250 juta tetapi uh, jumlah wang yang diterima oleh kerajaan hanya hanya berjumlah lebih kurang 150 atau 160 juta US dollar. Jadi di mana balance atau jum, uh, baki jumlah tersebut? Jadi orang tanya kenapa bukan keseluruhan jumlah wang tersebut dipulangkan kepada pihak kerajaan kenapa cuma sebahagian jadi perkara tersebut tidak tidak dijelaskan uh, secara secara uh, teliti lah kemudian isu yang kedua adalah isu berke, berkenaan isu yang sama tapi dia uh, terlibat dengan bagaimana uh, persetujuan ini dicapai ya kerana kalau kita lihat, uh, basically secara intipatinya apabila Riza Aziz um, memulangkan uh, uh, semula harta dan wang kepada uh, kerajaan Malaysia maka beliau 
tidak akan uh, didakwa di mahkamah. Yeah? Jadi ini perkara ini dia memberi satu persepsi yang negatif lah kepada uh, masyarakat secara umum. Yeah? Karena kalau kita membuat satu analogi dengan mungkin kes uh, rompakan. Yeah? Jadi kalau sekumpulan orang atau seseorang individu telah merompak uh, sebuah bank dan Men, uh, telah memperoleh kita beri contoh 10 juta ringgit ya? dan apabila beliau uh, dituduh di mahkamah beliau bersetuju untuk mengembalikan wang sejumlah 10 juta tersebut kepada pihak bank dan pihak pendakwaan tidak akan uh, meneruskan pendakwaan terhadap beliau jadi dalam kes beginilah kita dia memberi persepsi bahawa bagi kes-kes komersial, kalau kita boleh pulangkan keseluruhan atau sejumlah uh, wang atau subjek matter yang terlibat dalam kes tersebut, maka maka seseorang itu boleh terlepas daripada um, pendakwaan. Kemudian um, isu yang kedua adalah atau persepsi negatif yang kedua adalah bahawa ia menunjukkan bahawa bagi seseorang yang mampu ya, kalau kita lihat macam orang kaya atau orang yang berkemampuan boleh uh, melepaskan diri daripada sesuatu pertuduhan hanya dengan membayar uh, kompaun atau memulangkan dan atau memulangkan harta yang terlibat dalam sesuatu kesalahan dan persepsi yang um, satu lagi, sorry. Isu yang ketiga pula adalah bah- bahawa alasan sebenar kenapa pertuduhan terhadap Riza Aziz telah digugurkan uh, itu sebenarnya tidak diperjelaskan oleh, uh, secara uh, lanjut atau secara terperinci oleh Jabatan pihak ne- uh, Jabatan Peguam Negara kerana kalau kita, kalau kita lihat uh, sekiranya Riza Aziz tersebut di pendakwaan terhadap beliau diteruskan dan beliau didapati bersalah maka wang-wang atau harta-harta yang terlibat dalam kesalahan tersebut boleh dilucut uh, hakkan oleh pihak mahkamah. Jadi apa bezanya sekiranya uh, beliau memulangkan wang tersebut dan bayar kompaun dan sekiranya pertuduhan diteruskan dan Uh, pada sekiranya beliau didapati bersalah, mahkamah boleh mengarahkan beliau untuk uh, untuk harta-harta yang terlibat dilucut hakkan dan untuk beliau membayar denda ya, dan sebagainya. Jadi itu tidak berapa masuk akal. Terutamanya apabila uh, Jabatan Peguam Negara tel- telah membuat keputusan untuk uh, mengemukakan pertuduhan terhadap Riza Aziz sebelum ini. Jadi kalau pihak Jabatan Pegum Negara telah buat keputusan tersebut sudah pasti uh, mereka telah menganalisa dan 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 uh, meneliti kes tersebut dan dan mempunyai keyakinan bahawa terdapat satu kes prima facie terhadap uh, Rizal Aziz. Jadi kita kalau kita lihat kenyataan media yang telah dibuat oleh Jabatan Pegum Negara tersebut ia tidak menjelaskan kenapa pihak pendakwaan uh, becak memutuskan untuk untuk um, menggugurkan pendakwaan terhadap Rizal Aziz kerana alasan bahawa beliau akan memulangkan wang dan uh, dan harta dan membayar kompaun itu sebenarnya bagi saya tidak mencukupi untuk um, menjustifikasikan penggugurkan sesuatu uh, atau pertuduhan-pertuduhan terhadap uh, Rizal Aziz tersebut um, kemudian isu terakhir yang saya nak Uh, komen adalah berkenaan isu uh, apa yang kita boleh lihat macam satu kekeliruan di antara institusi-institusi kerajaan jadi apabila berita berkenaan Riza Aziz ni uh, uh, tular di di social media dan di media massa jadi kita lihat institusi-institusi kerajaan dan individu uh, membuat kenyataan ya yang mungkin bercanggah. Jadi pihak MCC berkata menyatakan bahawa um, peguam negara terdahulu Tan Sri Tommy Thomas telah bersetuju uh, 
uh, dengan dengan representasi tersebut. Kemudian uh, Tasfi Tommy Thomas pula telah membalas dan menyatakan beliau tidak pernah bersetuju. Ya, yeah. dan akhirnya uh, Jabatan Pegawai Negara pula telah uh, mengeluarkan kenyataan bahawa sebenarnya Tasfi Tommy Thomas telah bersetuju uh, atau pihak Peguam Negara telah menyatakan bahawa beliau dinasihatkan atau dimaklumkan bahawa uh, Tan Sri Tommy Thomas telah bersetuju secara prinsipal dan beliau bersependapat dengan uh, keputusan tersebut. Jadi isu isu ini um, dia memberi persepsi uh, yang negatif bahawa credibility uh, di antara atau kerjasama, kerjasama dynamicism di antara institusi-institusi kerajaan ini tak ada. Jadi kenapa terdapat institusi kerajaan yang menuding kejari atau men, bukan menuding kejari mungkin menyatakan bahawa oh uh, individu ini telah membuat keputusan kemudian individu tersebut a uh, a uh, pula menafikan perkara tersebut. Jadi saya rasa ini boleh memberi a uh, ini masyarakatlah secara umum boleh Uh, hilang keyakinan terhadap institusi dan pentadbiran kerajaan uh, semasa. Jadi itu itu itulah pendapat secara amnya itulah pendapat uh, saya tapi saya qualify pendapat saya kerana saya sebenarnya tak tak uh, mempunyai maklumat yang lanjut daripada kes ini daripada jabatan peguam negara atau daripada peguam bela yang mewakili a uh, tuduh. Jadi itu cuma pendapat peribadi saya lah ya? Terima kasih Josh tapi Terima kasih tapi Ada dua soalan lah lanjut Kalau kalau Riza sekarang Bersetuju membayar balik aset dan Wang kepada kerajaan Adakah ini bermakna Bahawa beliau telah mengaku Kesalahan beliau dan uh, Persepsi rakyat bahawa Beliau telah mencuri wang tersebut Itu betul jadi apabila orang kata oh ini trial by media sebenarnya bila sekarang beliau memberi membayar balik aset dan wang tersebut maknanya betul lah dia telah mencuri uh, wang tersebut adakah persepsi ini uh, kerana ada dua pandangan sudut uh, undang-undang yang kamu bincangkan tadi dengan sudut social science dengan sudut morality so public uh, agak keliru kerana moralitinya Uh, nampaknya tak selari dengan sudut pandangan undang-undang nah, itu soalan pertama, soalan kedua uh, Majid Singh Dylan pagi ini saya saya tengok ada whatsapp beliau telah menghantar satu surat uh, kepada Bar Council nampaknya uh, institusi kerajaan mempunyai masalah komunikasi tetapi majlis pekuam juga uh, me- me- telah mengeluarkan satu statement yang berbau uh, politik Uh, saya fikir isu ini uh, sekarang sangat hangat dibahaskan di antara di kalangan peguam-peguam apakah pandangan kamu berkenaan uh, statement Majid Sendila ni beliau telah menghantar satu surat kepada majlis peguam mengatakan majlis peguam telah salah dalam mengisukan satu statement berkenaan kes visa jadi Bar Council pun keliru ke? Um. Pertama, bagi soalan pertama tersebut, uh, saya secara jujurnya saya tidak melihat uh, surat representasi yang dikemukakan uh, oleh pihak peguam bela atau pihak pembelaan Riza Aziz. Uh, tetapi dalam satu representasi tersebut, biasanya represent, surat representasi tersebut dihantar secara without prejudice, tanpa prejudice. Uh, jadi ada kalanya uh, sesu- seseorang atau pihak pembelaan akan um, mengaku terdapat uh, sesuatu kesalahan yang telah dilakukan oleh seseorang tetapi ada juga situasi di mana um, tidak ada pengakuan dibuat dalam surat representasi tersebut ya, ia hanya uh, menjurus kepada isu undang-undang dan sama ada uh, intipati kesalahan dapat 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 di di uh, penuhi oleh atau dibuktikan oleh pihak pendakwaan jadi tapi saya faham uh, persepsi masyarakat secara umum uh, apabila kita melihat pada kenyataan media dan laporan-laporan berita yang dibuat terdapat satu gambaran bahawa 
uh, sekiranya beliau t- Rizal Aziz tersebut telah bersetuju untuk mem- memulangkan dan mengembalikan wang, ter- wang dan harta-harta yang terlibat maka uh, ia satu jenis pengakuan bukan pengakuan yang diterima di secara uh, undang-undang secara, diterima secara sah di bawah undang-undang dan di mahkamah tetapi satu bentuk pengakuan di mana beliau mengakui bahawa uh, wang-wang tersebut adalah um, proceeds of unlawful activity ya, adalah um, macam, bagaimana saya nak cakap dalam bahasa Melayu uh, satu wang uh, haram ya wang haram atau uh, harta haram. yang di, diperoleh daripada aktiviti haram dan uh, berke, berkenaan soalan kedua soalan kedua adalah Uh, berkenaan kenyataan media yang dibuat oleh majlis peguam um, saya saya bat, telah baca uh, kenyataan media tersebut uh, basic, ba, pada pendapat saya lah uh, kenyataan tersebut kenyataan media tersebut uh, walaupun dibuat uh, oleh pihak majlis peguam ia sebenarnya tidak menggambarkan uh, pandangan Uh, semua peguam di Malaysia Jadi uh, Saya tak tahulah uh, Pihak Presiden Majlis Peguam telah uh, Menerima uh, Nasihat atau telah Konsult dengan mana-mana peguam Tapi ia t- sebenarnya tidak menggambarkan Pandangan uh, ke semua Peguam lah uh, Saya cuma baca <laughs> Saya cuma baca kenyataan media tersebut Pada pagi ini dan secara peribadi Saya tak pernah bersetuju atau tidak pernah memberi persetujuan bahawa itu adalah pandangan uh, saya sebagai seorang peguam. Nampaknya bar council telah apa apa kata eh, lost its way the past few years. A lot of statements uh, have been I do not know maybe the new batch of bar council members have caused the bar council to be like this like see you I do not know I don't think he can speak on it but it appears that the bar council the past few years have just really lost their way. Um, and so even blaming the government and then asking government for help and then making statements that are completely out of order. You know, the Bar Council never makes this type of statement. But, you know, I think we should just call for an EGM and, and, and start looking at what the Bar Council really is doing. But I think that's another issue for another day. Lah. But thanks, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, we will now be answering some questions that were sent to us. So the first question is on employment. It goes, uh, if a company is going bust or wind up or decided to close down due to COVID-19, can the government take over a private industry or to, uh, so that they can retain workers and continue production or convert production to produce common consumer products? So what are the legal implications? What approach is, uh, what approach is better or direct acquisition or just buying the company shares? So can the government do it or better for GLC or Kazana to do it? Uh, Mike, would you answer this question? Uh, Mike, I think you're... Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks uh, for the question. Hi. Um, okay, to, to answer that, I think the government can take over uh, a private industry. Yes, it's essentially nationalization where uh, private assets are being transferred into public assets by bringing them under... Uh, the the public ownership of a state or national government so it's not new um but there there are two considerations for this i think the first firstly the government needs to look to determine whether it is necessary for uh the natural the national's interest and desirable to do so before embarking uh on the on nationalizing a particular private industry um during this pandemic the government may look into conditions such as whether the an industry is providing essential services but un, unable to operate you know because of lack of funds uh, or if the government sees the potential in a particular industry like you mentioned can be converted uh, in a way and for example to provide uh, essential services or you know it's a particular industry that can substantially improve the economy or provide or a particular industry where there's there would be a really high number of workers uh, who may lose uh, their job okay so but this this the government first needs to determine it's a policy determination and i think uh, it's good because it will help continue support the thousands of workers and also boost the economy uh, moving forward 
uh, amidst this COVID-19. Second is how it can be done, um, which I think is which deals with your second question. Uh, before, we see in the past, mass was nationalized through uh, the acquisition of shares by Kazana, uh, GLC. That's one method. Okay, the other alternative uh, is to enact a specific law, which I think the government uh, can, uh, to allow the government to nationalize uh, private uh, private industries. <clears throat> so an example is Section 114 of the uh, Water Services Industry Act 2006, which allows the minister, if he thinks it is necessary for the national interest, by order published in the Gazette, direct that the National Water Services Commission take control uh, of the whole or part of the property of a person holding a license issued under the Water Services Industry Act and continue carrying out uh, the licenses business. Okay, so that's the, the, the second way uh, of on how a government can nationalize. So um, we think, we personally think, we should, I personally think it should be legislated so that the government can be held accountable. Uh, that is why I think um, moving ahead in this next couple of months, the government needs to uh, convene parliament and also table such a law or COVID-19, uh, a law to deal with COVID-19, uh, which has affected many lives, uh, many Malaysian lives, um, uh, both economically and also uh, in, in terms of health. So, yeah, so I think it, it needs to be legislated soon to deal with all this. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Can I, can I just <laughs> add something? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I, we, we have personal experience because we were advising the then Menteri Besar of Selengo on the water takeover. <coughs> and those negotiations took a long time because some of the private companies could not agree to the price that they were going to buy out. And if you recall and look back to the archives, there was a discussion that the federal government and the Selangor government were discussing uh, possible plans subject to approval uh, by cabinet as to whether the provisions of WASIA to nationalize and the word is to expropriate the assets of those private companies so that the national, um, in the national interest so that the governments can take them over that was being discussed. Uh, that was not used in the end, but the provision is there in the law. And I, uh, for one, personally would support uh, so long as some conditions are met, especially where these services are essential and especially where it will affect a large population uh, of people who, uh, who have an income from it. So in a sense, I think we talked about it in the first chat or second chat, big government, I think we need government to legally, but also by way of a matter of policy, look at how some industries and some, some businesses uh, can be safe, and then to regulate those essential services. At that time, the argument for the water services industry was that a lot of the private companies were making a huge amount of profits. They were charging uh, money. They were making profits from a public good government was unable to control the non-revenue water, was unable to control the price of water. Um, and therefore, it was also in the national interest to take over, to streamline the way the water industry was being run. And I think we should start looking at it all over the world now with COVID. We are looking at bigger governments. We are looking at moving towards a model that is more caring. Some people call it caring capitalism or refined capitalism. Some people call it socialism. Some people call it postmodern neoliberalism. But the point is that we should start looking at measures to revive the economy and to save the jobs of people, as well as to look at giving more social protection in terms of health insurance uh, that is more universal for everyone without discrimination. So I think it's a very good question. We, again, don't have time to talk about it in a bit more detail, but we are prepared to actually look at it a bit more. Um, and in terms of the COVID law, what needs to be put into the law is something that needs to be discussed. And I don't think there's enough discussion among that in our society today. We, and, and we are lawyers. You, you don't expect lawyers to actually talk about this. We, 
want social scientists, we want political theorists to talk about this. We, where are the intellectuals in Malaysia talking about this? Where are the public intellectuals that are, are talking about this to create a movement to call for a bigger, more caring government? Uh, we are very limited as lawyers, but we feel that it's time, um, and this is not really our expertise, but I think it's time to try and enmesh law and social sciences to see how we can move Malaysia forward. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, man. Uh, the next question we have is also on employment. The question is, Section 24, Sub 7 of the Employment Act gives power to the Director General where the Director General on application by an employer may permit any deduction for a specific purpose from the wages of an employee subject to such conditions as he may deem fit to impose. Does that mean, irrespective of whether the employee agrees or not, the Director General is empowered to permit deduction that may seem fit? Is it the correct interpretation? Uh, Mike, would you answer this question? Uh, Mike, I think your mic is muted. Hi, yeah, firstly, I think I would like to point out that uh, this section 20 sub 7 is uh, a residual provision, but we first need to always look at the preceding provisions, which are subsection 2, 3, 4, and 6, which allows for, uh, which allows for permits for certain deductions under certain conditions. Um, this, this residual clause should only, uh, would only be applicable only if the, pre the preceding provisions, as I mentioned, uh, do not apply. But unfortunately, yes, um, that, that is the case. That is the interpretation of it. But um, to us, it seems unfair because employ employees are not involved in the process of this application or to determine what, what can be deducted, what cannot be deducted. It's between just between the employer and uh, the, the, the... It's just it's just by the employer. So it, it seems like a one-way street. Uh, and I also personally feel that this issue on reduction, especially when it comes to uh, migrant workers uh, and those low-income workers, uh, it it often it, it is often overlooked by them uh, because they may not understand the terms of the contract. And we have come across cases where we've seen uh, workers earning about only about bare minimum of a thousand two, and then but then at the end of the day, after substantial amount of deductions, you know, uh, like. To deduct the dormitory, the 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 monies for dormitory for the food and and whatnot, which which are said to be uh, in, in inverted commas permissible, but the problem is the employ employees like that, like migrant workers and uh, lower income uh, workers, they, they 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 do not know what uh what they are actually signing, which you know is is really unfair uh for for these these workers. So um, I think the law needs to be changed to allow some form of bargaining power uh, to, 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 for, for, to, for the employee so that they are not in a way uh, being coerced or forced into agreeing, into, uh, agreeing to deductions which they do not, they do not want. So yeah, that, that's our take, that's our take on, on this, this whole dedu deduction issue. Or, unfortunately, that is a re residual provision which allows for such, such, such applications to be made. But then uh, I think moving forward, the Employment Act in terms of deductions has to be, a, has to be amended to, to, to protect the, the employees more. But it should also, it should also, we should amend to limit the discretion of the DG. Because what the cases that we have seen is that the DG just sends the letter and says on the application of the employer, because the employee has written in, therefore the DG allows certain deductions. And yeah. you know the migrant worker, I've seen the letters, you have seen the letters. Yeah. The migrant yeah. worker does not know how to write. And yeah. we have seen the letters are not written by the migrant workers. What happens is that the migrant workers would sign on to contracts, not written in their own language, that has clauses that say, I agree for the employer to allow uh, to ask for deduction. And that the employer takes it to be the letter of consent. DG then says, okay. We have seen so many of these cases. Yep. It's crazy because the migrant workers that come to the plantations and we've, we've, we've gone down to the ground, we've seen it. You earn 1,002, your first uh, on arrival, you have to already pay something like 400, 500 for what is called basic necessities. You have to pay for cooking oil, you have to pay for rice, because purportedly, 
it's too far for you to go out and you're a newcomer, <laughs> right? And then every month there's deduction for your living expenses. <coughs> this is all supposedly allowed. So that discretion of the DG under the law, while it says there is that residual discretion, has to be now limited. That has to be amended. And that has to be amended clearly to allow uh, only a very limited category of um, discretion to the DG and for the employers to deduct. In fact, the minimum wage should also be increased yeah. because the poverty level of Malaysia is, is at a level, the poverty line of Malaysia is just unrealistic, 980. Uh, and relative poverty is not taken into account. We should be looking at a living a wage based on relative poverty. You know, so when Malaysia says that we have very a few uh, poor people, it's wholly untrue because the poverty line is 980 only. You imagine somebody, uh, are you able to live on 980? Actually, a lot of us are under in, in poverty as well. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Edmund. So the next question we have, it's, uh, it's a comment posted by one of our viewers. She asks, can Tan Sri Tommy Thomas sue MACC or the current AG for defamation? Does the statement made by them amount to defamatory statement? Considering the fact that the argument in relation to the decision to seek DNA could go either way. Uh, Sinyu, could you answer this? Uh, yes, thanks, Sue. Uh, but before I answer, I think I just want to comment on uh, two points. Uh, the first is on the Bar Council's uh, statement. Uh, sorry, not the Bar Council's statement, the statement by the President of the Malaysian Bar. And the second is uh, my own view on Riza Aziz's case before I answer that question. Uh, I think for lawyers that tune in and as also for those uh, members of uh, the public, it has always been the practice of the Bar Council that press statements are issued and they are prerogative. The President, he can issue a press statement without first going through uh, the Bar Council. There's a total of 38 of us who sits in the Bar Council. And uh, amongst the 38 of us, a president and uh, office bearers are elected. Now, if I understand that there are a lot of uh, unhappiness and there's a lot of uh, criticism with regards to the latest press statement by the president, uh, I think in the best uh, practice and the best traditions of the Malaysian Bar, uh, the Bar Council, and I'm sure the President as well, would welcome any such criticisms. So if you are a member of the Malaysian Bar, you are not happy with what has been said, you have every right and you should rightly exercise such right to complain to the President, to the office bearers, and also don't forget to complain to your representative if you are from the yeah, state. Yeah, you, you are there. Yeah. So we are complain to you. me. Like oh, how you have been complaining you? for the past five to ten write minutes. Long and write long letters, okay? I know that's a style, yeah. the procedure of bureaucracy. So you are here. We have just complained to you immediately. <laughs> Please, can you raise it? There are, there are many ways to complain. Edmund has chosen to complain by way of a live streaming on Facebook Live. That's fine. I'm not asking for letters, but you should voice out your dissatisfaction, if you have so, to your representatives. That includes me. And don't forget about those who are from the states. Ask them what they are. Hold them accountable. Ask them what their views are personally about their statement by the president. Don't let it slide and keep scrutinizing. So don't forget to do that. The second is my own personal view on what Riza Aziz's uh, DNAA means. I personally, I don't, I think it's, there's a lot of red herring uh, between what has been issued by the current AG and uh, what has been issued by the past AG and, you know, uh, whether the past AG was involved or not. For me, ultimately, it does not matter because even if some agreement in principle was reached by the past AG, the decision to DNAA was made during the tenure of the current AG. So the current AG cannot then say that, oh, I'm just deferring to the past AG, or 
the past AG has agreed, so I'll just agree. I don't think that's right. The buck ultimately stops with the current AG, and a decision has been made during his term, his tenure. So it is, for all intents and purposes, his decision. Cases like public interest cases where it involves public officials and those who hold high government positions, I feel when a decision to DNAA is being made or uh, to drop the charges or to no longer pursue the charge is being made, the, it's, only, it's only transparent and it's only accountable for the public prosecutor, the AG, to explain how and why he had arrived at such decision. I understand that there could be some privacy issues, there could be some uh, secrecy issues involved, but insofar as it is permitted, the AG should come out and explain. And when it involves high government officials, high public officers, this whole argument that, oh, this is private to me, or oh, it's going to uh, affect my privacy, I, I don't think that holds water because by the very nature of their position, they live under public scrutiny and it's it's its own it's in the best interest of uh, good governance you know, or rule of law constitution principles that an explanation is being made so we should continue to scrutinize why the decision to drop the charges were made for me i don't think it's satisfactory enough i think there should be a more thorough explanation so and that leads to my answer to the question uh, by nazira Yes, uh, TT can sue MACC or the current AG for defamation, but like all other cases for defamation, uh, he would need to first prove that the statement was indeed defamatory. Uh, and if it's defamatory, the court will then have to decide whether or not there is defense available to the uh, current AG or to MACC. So, whether that statement is defamatory, honestly, at this juncture, I don't know. I don't think there's enough information out there. But I suppose one could construe, one could infer that, oh, uh, a very poor decision or a very bad decision has been made or a decision that is quite questionable has been made. But honestly, it's, 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 it's not sufficient for me to comment on that. I'm just saying that he can do so. And if he does indeed do so, uh, then it's up for him to prove. I do, I'm not sure how he's going to prove that because uh, like he said, he's handicapped in that respect. He doesn't have access to the documents. He doesn't have access to the files anymore. And I think he should also be mindful that uh, whatever he divulged could amount to uh, a breach of the OSA or a breach of the penal code because this could be confidential information obtained in the course of his duties as the past AG. Uh, of course, uh, you know, if he does indeed manage to prove that it is defamatory, then the current AG or MACC, they can justify that uh, it is, he did make that uh, decision. And truth is uh, an absolute defense to all cases of defamation. So yeah, that's the, I'm sorry it's not really an answer, but it gives you a picture of the defamation process in warfare. That's the same for any defamation cases. Well, maybe can I Thank add you. something? Um, can I just add something? Thanks, uh, Sinyu. I think there are two points here. The first point is that if you look at the MACC's last paragraph, they were the one that started this problem. It's very strange. I've never seen in my 20 over years career where in a press statement, a public agency actually says, oh, this decision was actually made previously by the AG. I do not know why the MACC needed to have made that press statement, that last paragraph, and this started the whole issue about who made the decision. That's one. Number two, when the MACC says this decision was made by the previous AG, it appears now that Tommy Thomas has said, I did not make a decision. And it also appears now from the current AG statement that he was only told about something that may have been decided in principle, which may align with the current, uh, with Tommy Thomas's uh, statement that he did not actually make the decision. And so if you look at the players involved, 
And this is just from the, the press statements that are coming out. We don't know the truth, but just to clarify certain issues since there's a lot of interest in this. The two key players of the whole saga, Dato Gopal Sriram and Latifa Koya, have not spoken out. They are the ones that should actually also be speaking out to clarify the issue. Okay, thank you, Edmund. Thank you, Sinyu. Uh, we will have the next question. It's it goes, uh, lawyers are always doing dealings, negotiation, backdoor discussion, yeah, act with DPP, giving me an impression that this is part of normal behavior of criminal lawyers. So what is so different with this case, like this result of this case? Is it because he's Najib son or is it a new norm post-COVID? <laughs> Josh, could you take this? Um, yes, thank you. Um... Thanks for the question. I think this is uh, this question was asked by one of our loyal viewers, uh, Arun Chelvin. Uh, well, and I'm not really sure whether this is a question of a, or a statement, uh, but I will attempt to address the issues uh, that he has raised. Now, uh, as I, I have mentioned before, uh, in the course of conducting a criminal or defending uh, an accused person, criminal lawyers do discuss uh, uh, with the prosecution on how on the best method uh, to to go around uh, of disposing the criminal case. So an example of this, um, in fact, um, sorry, this practice has been uh, adopted by criminal lawyers for as long as I've practiced, uh, and maybe many years before that. And even for Arul's case previously in 2016, where he was charged uh, under the Sedition Act, we also submitted uh, a representation to the prosecution <laughs> to request for his charge to be withdrawn. So in that sense, there's uh, no difference or there's no change of uh, practice. Uh, it's just the only difference is that I think as compared to Arul's uh, sedition case, Riza Aziz's case has garnered more uh, media and social attention. So I think it's uh, imperative for uh, the Aegis Chambers to be uh, more transparent and to be more careful in the in the manner in which they are handling the case. There yeah, are public, public uh, personalities, right? Like Aru, you know, when their cases are dropped, a lot of people are very happy, but also a lot of people uh, have been outraged by that decision. So, but you know, the AG, like Wiza, this case didn't explain why it was dropped. So you know, it's it's it's, it's not a practice that should be encouraged. And I think the AG, uh, on hindsight, should have explained why the sedition charge against Aru and the M the two three three and uh, CMA charge against Aru was dropped. So maybe Aru, you should you should write into the current AG to ask for. A, you know, backdated explanation as to why that happened and you're very unhappy that uh, he didn't explain why the charge against you was dropped. But Aru didn't steal 100 over billion ringgit. Lah. You know, sedition, he was talking about Anwar's case, wasn't it? I think after the the decision. And, and, nevertheless, uh, and we did it for four billion more as well. I think we, we didn't earn any fees for that, right? Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, but, but Aru is okay. Okay, we, we are not putting you as... as as the, as the same class level or they're not saying that you are like Riza. Um, but sedition should actually go. I think our position is very clear from the law firm's position. Uh, we're very clear that the sedition act is uh, oppressive. It's, it has to be repealed completely. And it's a failure of the Pakatan government to not have been able to mobilize resources in their two years in power to actually have got rid of the sedition act. And now, we will start probably seeing a new arrests uh, and new use of the Sedition Act, Pota, Poka, Sosma, and all those laws that the Pakatan government uh, failed to um, repeal, uh, in spite of it, in spite of them promising to do so. But thanks, Aru, for the question and for following us. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is. Is, okay, um, Makama Bole Putuskan Seorang Itu Penjenaya Selepas Case Tamat Atau Yang Dituduh Mengaku Jadi Dalam Kes Riza, Riza Adakah Makama Tidak Boleh Declare Dia Penjenaya Atau Dia Masih Dianggap Penjenaya? 
uh, Josh, would you explain this? Ya, jadi seperti yang saya jelaskan uh, pada awal live stream tadi um, melalui su- surat representasi tersebut biasanya dibuat secara uh, tanpa prejudis jadi perkara tersebut tidak akan dimaklumkan kepada pihak mahkamah dan keduanya um, saya juga tidak melihat surat representasi tersebut dan tak tahu sama ada terdapat sebarang pengakuan yang telah dibuat oleh Rizal Aziz Walau apapun, sekiranya terdapat pengakuan bahawa beliau telah melakukan sesuatu kesalahan, itu seperti yang saya katakan uh, awal dalam awal, awal uh, live stream ini, ia tidak menjadikan ia satu pengakuan yang boleh diterima oleh mahkamah. Ya, yeah? jadi seperti, jadi uh, Encik Seven betul dalam menyatakan bahawa uh, mahkamah boleh putuskan seseorang itu sebagai seseorang, uh, menyabitkan seseorang itu dengan satu kesalahan dan memutuskan bahawa seseorang itu adalah satu penjenayah selepas kes tersebut tamat ya iaitu selepas perbicaraan penuh ataupun sekiranya tertuduh tersebut uh, mengaku uh, di atas kesalahan yang telah dipertuduhkan terhadap uh, beliau jadi soalan pertama uh, adakah mahkamah tidak boleh declare dia sebagai penjenayah uh, jawapannya adalah Yes, setakat ini uh, mahkamah tak boleh membuat sebarang perintah atau deklarasi bahawa Rizal Aziz adalah seorang penjenayah kerana terda- tidak terdapat sebarang pengakuan yang telah dibuat di mahkamah uh, dan keduanya uh, dan perbicaraan pun belum selesai jadi uh, mahkamah tidak boleh buat perintah atau deklarasi tersebut dan keduanya soalan kedua atau sama ada dia boleh dianggap penjenayah um, anggapan ini saya ini Anggapan ni kita perlu berhati-hatilah kerana um, secara rasminya beliau adalah belum dibuktikan uh, sebagai seorang penjenayah. Jadi apabila kita membuat uh, statement atau kenyataan uh, di media sosial atau di mana-mana, kita perlu berhati-hatilah sebab setakat ni uh, Rizal Aziz dia bukan seorang penjenayah. Jadi kita... T- Lama ada kita anggap dia sebagai penjenayah, itu adalah anggapan peribadi, itu adalah pandangan peribadi. Tapi nasihat saya kepada orang uh, masyarakat secara umum adalah kita perlu berhati-hati apabila kita buat kenyataan. Uh, kerana ia boleh uh, menjadi asas kepada satu uh, guaman, uh, defamation, fitnah, saman fitnah. Yeah. Terima kasih uh, atas soalan Dolai Sami Seven. Saya harap uh, jawapan saya tadi atau penjelasan saya tadi menjawab soalan uh, anda. Thank you Josh and thank you Steven for the question. So the next question we have is, are there grounds for judicial review of the prosecution's exercise of its discretion in Visa Aziz's case? Uh, Sinju, would you take this? Yeah. So, um, are there grounds for judicial review? I think... You know, it's very hard to comment on this, not knowing what exactly transpired and what the deal is. Uh, but generally, yes, uh, the decision can be judicial, uh, can be subject to judicial review. That has been uh, decided, uh, you know, uh, by the federal court that the the decision of the AG, uh, sorry, that was an obiter, but nevertheless, the federal court had indicated that the decision of the AG can be subjected to judicial review and recently uh, the High Court uh, had, uh, had judicial review, conducted judicial review on uh, the decision of the Attorney General. Uh, I think this was the Siwa, what's that to us? Who's the AI, ex-AIAC director again? What's his name again? Sundra Raju, yeah, Sundra Raju's case. So there's definitely precedent for that. Um, I think it's, you know, I can't really comment on uh, whether the the decision by the AG was made uh, improperly uh, or wrong in law. Uh, He is certainly allowed to do so, but you, to really answer your question, you really have to look behind uh, what he is permitted to do, because he is definitely permitted to do so, and look at the intention of him doing so. So if the intention is, for example, exercise in, uh, is, uh, you know, the decision was made in bad faith, then yes, there is, it's definitely uh, subjected to judicial review. Uh, 
uh, and then the other, just thinking out loud, the other problem uh, that uh, one might face is the issue of locus. Who exactly would have the standing to uh, commence judicial review against the decision of the EG? Uh, who exactly is the victim here? And whether a public-spirited individual uh, like Blackburn um, could could do so? You know, those are questions which uh, I think uh, you, we really need to look at. Um, are we addressing some comments? So, there's some by Siti Kasim. Oh, yes, we have one comment by Siti Kasim. She said that, seeing you, you guys don't have to wait for official complaint. In this day and age, any dissent found on social media should be taken against the BC statement. Okay, I agree with you that, you know, we don't have to wait for an official compa complaint because a lot of council members, they are very active on social media. So, uh, but, you know, if you are unhappy, I think you should go beyond posting on social media and let uh, your representatives on the bar council know what you have posted on social media. So after you post on social media, drop him a text, send him an email, bring it to his attention. Of course, I'm quite aware of what goes on on social media. I'm, I myself, I'm very active on social media. And, you know, it's, it's the right of every member of the bar to hold their office bearers, to hold their representatives accountable. So that should be, that is something that should be uh, encouraged. And if there is uh, unhappiness, you know, all the more reason for you to do so. So yes, I, I, I agree. But, you know, just be uh, more proactive than that. Let them know that uh, you have posted on social media so that they are aware of it and they cannot say that, oh, I didn't see. Thank you, Sinyu. Thank you, Siti, for the question. We, so we are actually coming to an end. I think it's almost 1 p.m. So uh, Emma would like to speak, just would like to wrap up this session. Emma. Yeah, thanks, so Thanks, everyone. Uh, again, we don't have the time to go into what we want to talk about. Um, we'll do one more next week. Uh, but I, I think before that, we have to appreciate the those people we call frontliners, right? But we always think of them as uh, the health workers. We forget that media personnel and yesterday, uh, unfortunately, one media personnel who was covering parliament from outside uh, fainted. Uh, I hope I hope uh, nothing uh, too, too bad happened. Um, but we forget that the media actually is an important fourth estate that brings us a lot of information that allows us to scrutinize and criticize, just as Sinu has, has mentioned. Um, I think what we need to really because there are a lot of strange things that are happening. One day, parliament journalists cannot enter uh, Riza Aziz's case. Um, there is a whole new way of looking at things uh, post-COVID. We, I think with COVID, we are looking at what's important to us. But what is happening around us, you see that there's problems with differences in class, differences in income group differences in how people perceive different things and the people in parliament they can sit in aircon rooms but then the journalists who are so important in trying to cover and to be to give news to the people are actually suffering in the hot sun uh, these kind of things are unacceptable we need to continue building the resistance we need to continue talking about it we need to continue having different voices not just lawyers. I see a lot of lawyers and law firms talk about webinars, talk about how to write submissions, how to market yourself. And, and that's all good. It's all a professional practice. But I think we need to have a coalition of lawyers, social scientists, uh, political theorists to start building the resistance again, to start giving us hope for Malaysia again, to start um, fighting authoritarianism as we see COVID spread. Uh, we should you know, think about looking at that kind of broad-based movement because, you know, we as lawyers just talking on, on the internet here is at the moment the best we can do with our time. But also we need to start looking at how we can mobilize. Thanks, Asu. You should invite social scientists and political scientists to join the Legal Aid Clinic since we are talking about all these issues. Otherwise, it's just lawyers. 
Yes, I agree. We should have more people, more professions in China. Okay, so thank you so much to our speakers and our audiences. Since it's 1 p.m., our Legal Aid Chit Chat session has uh, it's now coming to an end. We will have our next Legal Aid Chit Chat session same time at 12 p.m. next Tuesday. So during today's Legal Aid uh, session, Edmund touches on the COVID law. So for the next Legal Aid session, we will, we will be discussing more in-depth on the COVID law. So stay tuned. Right, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.